need you. We need you to fill us. We need you to speak into our lives. We need you to give us hope. We need you to teach us truth. We need you to pick us up when we've fallen down and, and give us a reason again. So, Father, tonight, we simply ask that you would be present in a powerful way, that we would sense that you're here, that our ears and our minds would hear your voice. And we would leave this place deciding to be obedient to the truth of God because Jesus is our Savior. It's in his name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles uh, or your Bible apps and find uh, the book in the Bible called Nehemiah. If you don't know where Nehemiah is, it's, uh, it's in the Old Testament, about a, you know, maybe a fourth of the way into the book. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, there's some Bibles in the pews that look just like this one. Go ahead and grab one of those and use one of those. It's on page 504 is where we're going to be. And, uh, and if you need a Bible, then take the, one of these with you. We want you to have the Word of God. If you're going to use the Word of God, we want to speak into your life. If you're just going to take it down to the swap market and sell it, then leave it here, okay? But, uh, but if you're going to use it, then feel free to take one of those. Hey, what is, uh, what is the riskiest or the most dangerous thing that you've ever done? I want you to take about 10 or 15 seconds and share with your neighbor the most dangerous thing or the riskiest thing you've ever done. Ready, set, go. What is it? You can't think of anything risky. You don't know. What about it, Kurt? <laughs> I just did. <laughs> yeah, I do. Later. <laughs> okay, so uh, some of you are probably going like, hey, that sounds like fun. Let's go plan an excursion and do that. Uh, Others of you just described your job every day because uh, I know some of you are police officers or firefighters. And, and, and so risk is part of your day in and day out life. Uh, last service, I can tell you, one of, the, one of the people I just ran out in the crowd and asked, they go, getting married a second time. Uh, so I <laughs> guess you could say getting married the first time. But, hey, you know, uh, I've done a lot of uh, things that people call risky. I've jumped off of cliffs. I've bungee jumped. I've traveled to exotic places, probably the... The craziest or riskiest thing was uh, taking my 12-year-old daughter and my mom to Nigeria. Uh, and uh, I didn't realize how risky it was. So I got there and they posted, uh, you know, police officers at the end of the hall with machine guns to protect us uh, of the hotel. I thought that was kind of cool. But, uh, you know, some of us are risk takers and some of us kind of prefer to play it safe. Right? And you kind of know where you are on that extreme. Some of you are very, very comfortable with risk. Uh, some you try to avoid it every chance you get. Well, tonight we're continuing our series about Nehemiah. Uh, the series is called The Project because Nehemiah uh, wanted to build the walls of Jerusalem back up after they'd been torn down. And we're in chapter 2 of Nehemiah. And we're talking about Nehemiah's risky encounter. Uh, let me just give you a little background uh, in case you weren't here last week. Nehemiah is a servant of Artaxerxes, who's the uh, king of Persia. Uh, so in other words, he is a personal servant to the most powerful man on the face of the earth at the time. And he's a cupbearer, which means that he tastes the wine before the king drinks it to make sure it's not poisoned. And so he's a loyal servant. He's trusted by the king. And, uh, and he hears about Jerusalem. And how Jerusalem, the walls are broken down, uh, the city is in shambles, the people are distressed and, and defeated, and, and they're living in dangerous conditions. And Nehemiah wants to rebuild the walls of the city. And, and so Nehemiah takes a risk, first of all, by deciding to be transparent. Transparent. Look at Nehemiah 2, beginning in verse 1. It says, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. Now, 
Nehemiah, his job, as I mentioned, was to taste the wine and to make sure it's not poison. And because he is a trusted and loyal servant, he's been close to the king a lot. And the king has never seen him looking like this. Uh, and, and he decides not to hide his feelings or his burden for his people. And so he reveals the sorrow in his face. In other words, he, he risked being transparent because he could have done what so many of us do, right? Which is just, you know, put out the smiles on our face, even, you know, trying to cover up the pain and, and just hide what's really going on inside of us. But Nehemiah allows himself to be seen grieving for his people. And, uh, and transparency is always risky. If you choose to be transparent, you're taking a risk. Uh, what kind of risk? Well, you, people might judge you. People might condemn you. People might ridicule or exclude you. And, and I just want you to know here at Calvary, we value transparency. Uh, because we kind of reject that whole religious game of hiding our struggles and pretending that everything is, what's the word we use? Oh yeah, fine. Right? Right? Because a lot of times we just want to put the smile on our face, come to church, and people say, how you doing? And we just go, fine. And sometimes we are fine. And sometimes we're dying on the inside. But we really don't want to let people know that we're struggling or that we're hurting or that we failed. Uh, but the truth is, to have authentic relationships requires transparency. It's a risk for us to let others see us. And it was a great risk for Nehemiah because the king noticed and he asked why. So Nehemiah gave the king an explanation. Read on. Actually, I want to pick up at that last part of verse 2. It says, Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? He shares that burden with the king. Why shouldn't I be sad? Here's the situation. Now, why was he afraid to explain his sorrow? Did you, did you catch that? I was very much afraid. The end of verse 2. I was very much afraid to tell him why I was sad. Why would he be uh, afraid of that? Because there were five possible responses that the king had, and four of them were bad. In other words, right up front, he had an 80% chance of failure in what he wanted to accomplish. But he chose to explain anyway. Think about this. King Artaxerxes could have just ignored him. Oh, that's really nice. I'm really sad for you. Okay, wine, please. He could have fired Nehemiah. Think about this. I mean, Nehemiah is a slave. He's living in the lap of luxury. He is a servant in the palace. And, you know, even though he's a servant, everything is taken care of. The, the king could have said, you know, you don't seem like really to have your mind on taking care of uh, the wine and me. So why don't you go work in the fields? Or why don't you go work in the mines? Or why don't you become the exterminator for the rats in the palace? So he took a risk, could have been fired, could have been worse, he could have imprisoned Nehemiah. How dare you care more about a city a thousand miles away than you care about me? Go to prison, think about it there. Or worse, he could have killed Nehemiah. He could have had him executed for being disloyal. He said, well, you know what, if you're so worried about your people, and if I don't care about your people, then I can't trust you anymore. Maybe you'll poison me yourself, uh, and just had him executed. It happened. Well, the king didn't do any of those things. Instead, you see the king's response in verse 4. This is kind of cool. It says, Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? What are you requesting? What is it you want me to do for you? And we see Nehemiah's request in verse 5. And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will you be gone, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city for the house that I shall occupy." And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. Now, notice what Nehemiah did. First of all, he requested that he be allowed to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And again, this is not a small request, because we're talking about years, not days or weeks or months. 
We're not talking about a maternity leave. We're talking about, hey, I'm going to be gone for a couple of years minimum. I mean, it probably took him like two, three months just to travel there. You know, and for them to send the lumber or get the lumber and do all this kind of stuff, we, you know, this is not a short time. And so he asked for that, and the king and the queen agreed. Again, he's a trusted servant, and they didn't really want to see him go, but they said, okay, we'll let you go. And then, because the king was going to let him go, he asked for the king's authority and the king's resources. Okay, if you're going to let me go, then can I have letters saying that it's safe for me to pass, and can I have your stuff? <laughs> right? Isn't that what he asked for? I need stuff from the royal forest. This is your forest. This is where you get your lumber for your buildings, and I want to use this for my city. That's pretty bold when you think about it. This is a servant who's asking these things, and the king gives him what he asked because God's hand was on Nehemiah. Now, that was Nehemiah's risky encounter. Let's talk about Calvary's risk. Now, uh, when I talk about risk, uh, I'm not really talking about the building program that, we in, that we're in. If you're not uh, aware that we're getting ready to break ground in about a month or two uh, over on Sweetwater, uh, we're going to build a new sanctuary that can hold more people so that right now we don't have to have five services. We'll just go back to four and uh, so we can continue to grow. Uh, but uh, I shared last week that we're building for the right reason and at the right time. I mean, we're building because we've outgrown our facilities and we want to fulfill the mission of Christ to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. That, that's what we're doing this for. And so when I talk about Calvary's risk, I'm not really talking about the building itself being a risk. Here's why. Uh, you may or may not know this, but you know, over the last uh, two and a half years, we've raised a million dollars cash that you guys have given. And... Uh, we've already put in our budget the mortgage payments that we anticipate we might have to make. In other words, if you look at the 2014-2015 budget as reflected in the bulletin, then uh, what you see the expenses including are payments to ourselves in advance of the payment we expect to make. So the stewardship team has taken care of putting us in a great financial position. So we're not really talking about a financial risk. So what risk are we talking about? Well, let's talk about several different risks. First of all, my risk. Challenging you to ask God. Challenging you to ask God. Here's, here's the challenge. I want every family that's part of Calvary to ask God what he desires them to give to the Sweetwater Building Project. I'm asking every family of Calvary that's part of us to ask God what he would have them to do. Now, uh, I say it's my risk because it's always risky to talk about money in church, isn't it? You know, because uh, a lot of people think all they want at the church is my money. And so, you know, as, as somebody who, you know, likes people to kind of like him, I don't really want to offend people by talking about money. That's just the truth. And I don't want you to have that impression that all we want is your money. So I don't know what people give here at Calvary. You may or may not know that. I don't have a clue what anybody drops in the offering box, uh, what is collected, what is sent in. I don't know what the donations are or aren't other than the bottom line dollar amount that you see. So I don't know what people give because that's between you and God, not between me and you. I just assume everybody gives as much as they can because you know that uh, God's going to bless you. And so I figure you're brilliant and you're doing that. But uh, uh, that's why we don't take an offering or pass the offering plate because it's between you and God. If you're a guest here at Calvary, we do not expect you to give to support the ministry of Calvary. How about that? We're, we're not looking for you to, to contribute to our ministry because it's not a ministry that you believe in yet. But if you call Calvary your spiritual home, if this is the place where you planted your life and God is blessing you in this place, we invite you to give, to contribute. And we figure that if you want to contribute to the ministry of Calvary, you can find the offering boxes. They're not exactly hidden. But guess, you know, we don't want to try to coerce you or talk you into to giving. That's between you and God. Now, I say that, but we also are unashamedly teaching biblical stewardship here at Calvary. You know, we teach the Bible, and because God happens to talk about money a lot, we're not afraid to talk about money as it applies to you and to me before God. And, and so, uh, you know, we teach that God doesn't need your money because he owns everything. And we teach that because God owns everything, he's the one who's blessed us with what we have. And the truth is, we need to be generous because Jesus said that's part of how we experience the blessings of God. And so I'm challenging you to ask your king. 
What is it your king wants you to give to the Sweetwater Project? Now, I challenge that knowing that about 25% of you are already giving to the building project. You've been doing that. I mentioned that 25% of this church has donated over uh, about a million dollars the last two and a half years. That's kind of cool. But whether you've given a dollar or nothing at all, will you ask God what he wants you to do for the Sweetwater Building Project? That's my risk. That's my challenge. And if you will, that leads us to your risk. Your risk is seeking God's favor. Yeah, that doesn't really sound like a risk, but it was for Nehemiah. He asked the king for permission, and he asked the king for resources. And your risk is seeking God's favor. How so? You see, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment personally to follow Jesus, then you already are in a place where you want God's favor. Anybody here not want God's favor, specifically? Uh, Yeah, I wouldn't raise my hand either, because it's like, don't really want to play with God that way, do you? No, it's built in. We say, hey, we believe that Jesus is our Lord and we're going to follow Jesus with our lives because we believe that every time we follow Jesus, he leads us to blessings. Every time we obey God, he's going to pour out his his, uh, goodness in our lives. And, And so we want to be faithful servants. So what's the risk in seeking God's favor? Because if you ask, what should I do? God, we want your favor for the Sweetwater Project, then God is going to send you. Just as Nehemiah said, I want to go build the walls, you say, God, we want to do this project so that we can impact our city with the gospel of Jesus Christ, then he's going to say, I've got a job for you. I've got a task for you. I've got something I want you to do. And he will use you to accomplish his purposes. And as you do that, he will bless you as you are part of building God's kingdom. That's how this works. See, a lot of us, we kind of get it backwards. You know what we do? We start thinking, hey, God, if you'll bless me, then I'll bless other people in your name. And God goes, no, 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 that's not how it works. See, it's this whole faith thing. What I want you to do is I want you to bless other people in my name, and as you do that, I'll bless you. And a lot of us are stuck in a place where we're waiting on God to do something that he's already said, I'll I'll follow your lead. I'll follow yearly. That's what Jesus meant when he said, give and it will be given to you. For the measure that you use, it will be measured out to you. And, and so a lot of us are kind of stuck in that place where we go, okay, God, you go ahead and bless me and I'll bless it. No. He'll bless you as you do your part to bless his kingdom. Now, some of you already know that because you've been supporting the building project. You've been giving to the church, you know, 5, 10, 20 years. You understand the power of generosity in your life and no one has to convince you to give. You're the people who are going, amen, inside, because you're not saying it out loud. Now, some of you are sitting here, and you want to give. You, you really do. You're listening to this going, yeah, I want to give, but you don't think you can afford to give. I mean, you, you desire to be generous, but because of debt, because you lost your job, because of life circumstances, you really believe that you can't afford to give. And there's others of you, let's just be honest about it, don't want to give anything at all. In fact, it's really never even occurred to you that you might need to donate anything to God. After all, he owns everything and has it all, so he doesn't need your stuff. So, will you take the risk and ask God for his favor for the Sweetwater Project? Will you pray and ask God, what do you want me to do? As your follower, as your servant, what do you want me to do? Will you take that risk, and then will you do whatever it is that God tells you? Because understand, it doesn't matter to me the amount. If you ask God and do what he says, then that's a win. Whatever it is, if you ask God and do what he says, because the only place of no risk is obeying God. I want you to hear that. The only place that there's no risk whatsoever is you doing what God asks you to do. Because when we follow Jesus, he blesses our life. Again, we don't get to determine which kind of blessings God pours into our life. We just know that as we follow Jesus, God blesses our life. And and every time we follow God's direction, we win. That's reality. 
And when we take God's word and we apply it to our life, he leads us into life. And we know that. So honestly, I'm not interested in everyone uh, in the church giving to the building project. What I am interested in as your shepherd is that everyone in the church being obedient to God. At every part of your life. Now, since we're talking about this risk stuff and asking God and stuff like that, I, I, I want to take the, the last couple of minutes and, and speak to, to everyone in the room. Because I think everyone in this room is in one of three places tonight. I, I hope you'll listen to this and kind of figure out where you fit. And Because I've got some real practical things I want to challenge each uh, kind of group to do. The first group of people I want to talk to, because uh, again... This is about obeying God. This is about are we going to really take the risk and, and have a conversation with God and say, God, what do you want me to do? And then apply ourselves to doing it. The first group that I want to talk to are the people who are struggling. And, you know, you just don't have many resources. You're kind of living paycheck to paycheck. You're actually wondering how you're going to make it through the end of the month. You're, you're drowning in debt and you don't see any way in the world that you can be generous. You don't see any way at all that you could give anything. You just go, I I just don't have it, you know, to give. Two things. First of all, we offer a class a couple of times a year called Financial Peace University. It's it's a Dave Ramsey class. And if you're in that first group that I'm talking to, you're just drowning in debt, then I want to encourage you the next time we offer that class for you to take it. Because it is a class that will teach you step by step how to get out of debt, how to stay out of debt, how to get control of your finances so that you can be generous. It is a how to, you know, get control of your financial life. And so if you're tired uh, of just barely making it, then the next time we offer that, which will probably be in a month or so, then then sign up for it. Second part of this, if you're struggling to make it and, and you're saying, I can't afford to give, let me challenge your thinking on that. Because in God's economy, He's not interested in amounts. He, he, he sets a percentage of obedience. And the biblical percentage is 10%. See, and in God's economy, 10% of a million dollars is the same as 10% of $100. He doesn't care about the dollar amount because he owns it all. He cares about our faith and obedience. And, and so if we, if we simply say, okay, God, you know that I'm not giving anything because I can't afford to, but I'm going to trust you. I'm going to take a step, and, and I'm going to believe in you. Then, then give me a number. Give me a percentage. And it may start off with, with 1%. It may start off with 2%. And, and you start taking that step and saying, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. Show yourself faithful in my life. Give God that opportunity to surprise you because he'll do it. And, in fact, I think he'll surprise you so much that you'll start up in that percentage pretty quick. Because you'll find out that God can change your life and do things that you can't even imagine. Now, some of you are are arguing in your head because you're not arguing out loud. But I can't afford to be generous. And if God would just give me the resources, then I'd be generous. And and I want to just kind of share with you that I think if that's your attitude, then you're lying to yourself. Generous doesn't have anything to do with how how many resources you have. It has everything to do with the attitude of your heart. Generosity is a characteristic of God. It's one of the characteristics of Christ that that is built into our lives. That the Holy Spirit is trying to teach us to be generous. And so here's what I found. If you're you're not generous when you're poor and you suddenly come into a lot of money, you're not generous when you're rich. But if you're generous when you're poor, you'll be generous if you have a lot of resources too. Because generosity isn't about amount. Amount. It's about attitude. So if you don't have much, will you still ask God what he wants you to do? Will you take that risk? Now, the second group I want to talk to are the people with resources. You know, you're sitting here tonight, and God has blessed you tremendously. Uh, I mean, you've just got a great work ethic, and you have worked well, and you've invested well, and, and you've been wise in the way you've handled your resources, and you've got extra I mean, and you're enjoying life, and you kind of uh, are thinking, wow, I've done well, God, you're, you're really good. And maybe you're praising God for that. Maybe you recognize that God's the one who gave you the talent, gave you the abilities, gave you the opportunities. And, and maybe you think the whole rest of the world should think and act exactly like you, which we all have different gifts, so they won't. But, uh, but you're kind of going, yeah, you know what? God's really blessed me, and I'm in a good place. Uh, will you ask God what he wants you to do? Because I'm pretty sure God didn't give you the extra just for you. 
I'm pretty sure that he gave you the extra and gave you the ability to make money and, and, and capitalize money and all that kind of stuff so that you could build his kingdom. And there may be some of you sitting here that you're, uh, you know, you've know, you got so much extra that God has given you that uh, you could literally have an impact on the entire next generation of Lake Havasu City. You could give a kind of a legacy gift where you could say, hey, wow, my gift could, could have a ripple effect beyond my time in this world, in this place, through the ministries of Calvary. So if you've got lots of resources, are you willing to take the risk and ask God what he wants you to do? Because you may not like his answer. Then again, you may find that his answer is delightful. But you got to ask God. And then there's a third group. And, and this people, you may find yourself in both those other groups, but the third group I want to talk to are people who've already been given regularly and faithfully to the ministry of Calvary and to Sweetwater Project. And you're sitting here, you're listening, and, you're, and then you're just like, uh-huh, uh-huh, that's right, amen, I got it. You know, I've got this generosity thing down, I've been given, I've been faithful, I've been tithing, I understand how awesome God is, and he's going to prove himself faithful. And, and actually, you kind of got pumped up while I'm preaching, because you're like, yeah, I got this. This is a sermon for them. <laughs> At 75% amen, contributing to it, y'all need to listen. Listen good. I'm talking about you, and you, and you. Because I have it. <laughs> See, the problem with that is two things. Number one, pride uh, kills us. It's a great way to become a Pharisee, right? To think you've got it down because God needs to teach you something else. you just got to have the courage to go ahead and ask him what he wants you to do. And secondly, complacency is the playground of Satan. So when you start getting to that point where you just give and it's on autopilot and you don't think about it and you don't pray over it and you don't get excited about it, you just do it because it's habit then you and God need to have a conversation because God may want you to up that amount if it's so easy for you to give it. And so will you, those who are already contributing, those who are already a part of this, will you go ahead and have that conversation with God and say, God, what is it you want me to do? Because I want to see your kingdom come. I want to see your will be done in this place as it is in heaven. Will you ask God? And then will you do what he says? That's always the rub, isn't it? That's always the hard part. Because most of us sitting here in this room already know the things that God wants us to do and we're choosing not to do them. So I challenge you tonight. I'll take the risk. Ask God and do what he says. If you'll take that risk, you'll be blessed. We'll be blessed. In fact, this entire community will be blessed as Jesus Christ is honored. But it all starts with having the courage to ask the king. Will you pray with me? Father, we praise you tonight because of your amazing grace. You sent your son into this world to save us from our sins. You've given us life. In fact, you don't even call us servants. You've adopted us as sons and daughters of God. Lord, you've allowed us to serve you, to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth. It's, it's incredible that you would have invited us, uh, this group of rebellious sinners, to be the representatives of Jesus on this earth. It's amazing that you have placed your Holy Spirit in these uh, broken, sin-tainted bodies to teach us and to empower us. And tonight, Lord, I pray that every one of us who claim to be followers of Christ would seek your face, would listen to your voice, and you would give us the courage to obey you, to know in our heart of hearts that that's going to lead us to blessing. So God, let us hear you and give us the faith to act on whatever it is we hear. Thank you most of all for loving us, even when we ignore you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and worship our God.